then I joined the research establishment, but I can't remember how that happened. Fortunately, there was a group of people in this, building up this radar system, who were sensible enough to know they didn't want university dons, they wanted university dons if they're good, they wanted anybody who had something. And it was an incredible build-up of talent, which otherwise would never have been utilised. I must have been about 18. And for some reason, I don't know why, but there was a lot of other people like me. Um, and I went to Bournemouth to a place called RSRE, or whatever it was called in those, those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we worked in labs. We had to learn how to use lathes, because we had nobody else to do it there. No workshops. Drilling machines. How to bend chassis. Two holes in the chassis. Yeah. Because there was nobody else to do it. Later, oh, in Morven, we had the workshops. You just said to them, do it, and they did it. Yeah. But at first, we all had to do it ourselves. Uh, but it was an amazing opportunity because at that time we knew nothing. All we knew was wireless sets with big valves in it. And when you think what we can do now, yeah. So, you were going to climb a mountain which is a hundred times higher than Everest, learning all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember sitting on a, a, a cliff, at the top of a cliff, in a cabin, which must have been a builder's cabin, and we put a radar in it. Because it was a builder's cabin, we could actually turn it, the whole cabin turned. Which was marvellous because we could point the aerial wherever we wanted to. Now people would say, "Why don't you just turn the aerial, spin it?" Because we didn't know how to. What and maintain the actual connection? No, we could, you could put a motor on an aerial and turn it. Yeah. But you had to have power going through the joint, mm. not spitting and scarring, but actually going cleanly through. And mm. we didn't know how to do. I wrote how to make a joint which rotated, and took all the power through it. We need, what we needed was a rotating joint and there was a team of people working on the rotating joint and in all radar systems since, when you look at the catalogues of parts, it says rotating joint. And there I was doing this and we didn't know how to rotate the area. People now see areas going... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and there's such famous things came along. Well, in, in the old days, of course, and what started radar was people had wireless sets and they used to listen to the BBC on long wave. And in some places, like near Heathrow, they used to get a lot of interference when aircraft flew by. It didn't happen a lot because there weren't many aircraft flying in those days. And somebody said, wait a minute. What's and what said? If it interferes with the signal, we know there's an aircraft there. Perhaps we can utilise that. Now that's long wave. So they built a structures up, which are just not a uh, hundred yards high. Mm -hmm. to make it. And then, it, and it did. In fact, every time an aircraft flew out there, you could hear it. So then, the first radars they had their own transmitters, long wave, long wave. 200 meters or something like that, not something different to that. And, they used to, and that was how it was first done. Mm. Then it changed when the magneton came along. Now the magneton produced microwaves, microwave power. The first, it was developed at Birmingham University. And I can tell you a very funny story. The first one was brought to Morven by Nigel Nichols. Mm. And on his way back, he went into a telephone box to make a phone call. Then he continued up the road and he thought, Oh my God, I've left the magneton in the phone box. Well, okay. And he went back and it was still there for Oh, it, it produced microwave power, <coughs> which meant we could produce quite a lot of power. We could send the power out in pulses. 
we could send the power up, we could make an aerial which is five yards wide, it's got so much amplification and microwave. So if you make a, a one megawatt transmitter, it's like sending out 100 megawatts. So you have more and more range. And because it's a very narrow beam, not like 200, not like long wave, you've got a reflection in very precisely there, mm -hmm. rather than somewhere, somewhere over there. So, but it would, in modern days terms, it would be equivalent to, I don't know, losing the plans to the next A-bomb or far more. It's an uh, incredible... Uh, yeah, the main job was an enormous step, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he left it in the phone booth. And he left it in the phone booth. <laughs> and then rushed back and found it and it was still there. Well, people wouldn't know what it was anyway. <laughs> wouldn't know what it was. They could take it, but they wouldn't know what it was. Then. <laughs> It was set the whole one. <coughs> and that magnetron and the first radars worked on what we called S band, 10 meters. Mm -hmm. we've, gone from, we've gone from 200 meters mm. wavelength to 10 centimeters and then to 3 centimeters. Presumably, the higher frequency gave you better resolution. Oh, yeah. Better and resolution, more. greater power, greater transmitted power, higher gain antennas, more precise antennas. Mm. The magneton came in 1942, I think. Yeah, that, that's oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. And there's no doubt, obviously, that it shortened the war or aided the oh, allies sure, it's incredibly. Yeah. But like all the things we did, everybody now uses them. Because everybody's got a microwave cooker and uses a magneton. <laughs> One of the problems is sending, if you use valves, everything is high impedance. And if you want to send a signal down a long cable, the low cable, the, the cable is low impedance. I use the words impedance. So in order to match the two together, you need something big to small. And what you had is a big transformer. Like if you had the output of a radio, high impedance, one of the low impedance speakers, it's only got a few times of wire on the speaker, you have to have an tra output transformer. And all the time we had transformers, and they were so difficult to make. You put a signal in, it was a nice square signal, and come out, it'd be like that. So any information in the signal was lost. And then suddenly, somebody came along with the simplest circuit you can imagine, HT down to the anode of a valve, resistance in the cathode, resistance from the grid to the cathode. And everybody said, what the bloody hell's the use of that? And they were the magic words. If somebody said that, what the bloody hell is the use of that? Everybody stopped and said, this is it. Another step forward for mankind. Because if it, and it was the cathode follower, which meant we could now put down a tenth of a millionth, tenth of, a microsecond pulse, millionth of a second pulse, from here over to there, down a cable, and it came out exactly the same shape. So now you could use it, you could put in things like, you could see the front of the pulse, it tells you more information about the aircraft. You could measure the frequency of the pulse using Doppler, to get the speed of the aircraft. Now I'll tell you about the cathode phone, I'll tell you about the magnetons, now everybody's got one in their microwave cooker. Same is true of the cathode follower, which enables us to get very short pulses. Every loudspeaker in the system in the world is fed with the cathode follower. Don't have transformers. This was the beginning of hi-fi, because without you can get